What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Millionaires to Billionaires podcast. If this is your first time tuning in, I'll give you a little update of what the podcast is about and what we do here. So we like to travel the world, interview successful people, successful entrepreneurs, influential people with all walks of life. And everybody has a different story and a different journey that they've been on. But the beauty of it is if you pay attention to the conversations that we have, a lot of people use the same habits, the same routines, or the same dynamic of strategy throughout their life to get them to where they're actually at today. So today, uh, I'm bringing to you guys Michael Law, co-host Blake Hahn. We have a good friend of mine, Patrick Kilpatrick, actor, been in uh, over 200 films. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. How's that been? Uh, it's films and television shows. Um, How's it been? It's been a career. I mean, it's been my life, uh, uh, sort of a volume thing. Uh, When I first was an actor in New York, I kind of did what was there. And uh, I noticed that there were 164 television shows out here. There was a lot more work. So I moved out here. It's been great. I have really enjoyed it. I'm mostly functioning as a screenwriter and producer now, but... um, Occasionally acting. I'm getting ready to do a Western called Black Creek uh, with Cynthia Rothrock, and uh, it's been my life. It's been a really great thing. I'm actually very lucky because I think the combination of writing and acting, and uh, I've done a lot of teaching, um, so there's always something going on for me, which when we have mentored young people or people of all ages who wanted to be in entertainment, we always say, cultivate as many skills as you can, because then that gives you a sanctuary psychologically and, uh, and, and economically uh, from a business that can really radically change and go up and down. What do you think you love most about what you do in, in your career after now looking back on everything? Do you think you like more of being more involved in actually acting in the films? Do you like more of directing the films, or do you really like helping and educating and teaching other people that are getting into your space? Like, what do you really like love about your career and what you do? It's really a great question. Um, At this point, I'm really reveling in the the variety of it. It's a little Um, bit of everything. Yeah, because I I love acting, but acting really for me is, it's hard work, but it's also almost a lark. Um, I'm in the middle of directing, producing, writing and acting. A project which may be a, a bridge too far, uh-huh. but um, I, I, I like the fact that on any given day, I, I really don't know exactly what it is I'm going to need to do that particular day, whether it's write uh, or produce. I'm, I'm doing a lot of finance. Uh, in fact, Michael and I met because of my work as a, f- a financing person. And really what I like most is learning something new. And a lot of times the universe drives you into that. Yeah. Uh, And so I I might not have been so inclined to learn as much about distribution as I I do now because I was driven to it uh, by economic necessity. So um, I like being an expert at what I'm doing. And that's a a situation that's always evolving because the business is always evolving. So, but I I, I like people being able to come to me. Uh, A lot of our work happens because I get hired as a consultant first, and then I'm able to impart to them uh, where they might be going wrong in what they want to do with a particular film or media project. Um, and that usually leads to screenwriting and casting and the multitude of things that go on in, into a production. Um, <clears throat> acting is a, a lark compared to doing all those right. other things. Right. Now, if we can and everything, I know we hopped right into it, but let's uh, take, take everybody back. Like, where are you from, man? Like, how, how, where, what's your childhood? Like, where are you from and everything? Yeah. Did you, like, uh, how were you raised? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I wrote a memoir. I have another volume of it to come. But a therapist once joked and said, you're the only person I know who has a two-volume memoir. But um, 
I was born in a small town in, in uh, Virginia called Orange, Virginia, and my dad was a math teacher and a baseball coach at a uh, sort of a renowned prep school there when I was born, which I went to later, 13 years later. Um, uh, he moved us to Connecticut because he, he became an insurance executive. I was raised in a very kind of weird dichotomy because it, we were privileged. We had horses and great food and very uh, great educations. Uh, but my mother had some uh, mental challenges. And so home life was a bit of a war zone uh, because of that. But all in all, I consider myself really, really blessed. Uh, back and forth between Virginia and Connecticut, which if you know the history of America, uh, at least on the Eastern seaboard, that's a pretty good mix of what was going on, New England and Virginia. Uh, so I was very lucky, very lucky. Horses, of course, we were raised with horses and that stood me in good stead when I did Westerns mm -hmm. and uh, firearms were everywhere and nobody paid any attention to it and that helped when I got to playing bad guys and things like that in movies so uh, and I was very much into athletics um, at the time and acting is fairly athletic uh, at least the way I approached it but um, so you know football basketball baseball horseback riding swimming uh, fencing, uh, anything. Like I said, I like Just learning everything. new things. Athlete. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wrestling. Like, how old were you when you when you when you hopped into your like your first acting, like like production, like movie, or getting into the space? Like, how old were you? I was actually thirty-two. Um, uh, what happened was at seventeen, I had a really bad car accident. I was a passenger in a car, broke my back, couldn't play sports, mm. um, so. I'd always been into reading, and so professionally I became a writer, and I did that for about 10 years, kind of restored my body back through massage and chiropractic and, and, and balanced exercise. Yep. And so when I got to, uh, uh, I became a very high paid advertising writer and journalist, and uh, got bored with that after about 10 years, so I, I left to write a novel, and I split a house with a, a, a man named John Tillager, who was an, a longtime actor, becoming a, a, a big-time Broadway director. And so I wrote a play instead of a novel, and the, the play got produced, and I was asked to join theater companies uh, <clears throat> as the guy who selected the plays. It's called a literary manager. Mm -hmm. And so then I started dabbling with the acting, and it kind of took off, and it was kind of meant to be. You so, think that was uh, probably your pivot and everything? It's like crazy, like, we don't understand, like, how things, why things happen to us in a certain way, but, I mean, just hearing your story as an athlete and everything, playing all these sports, you're an athlete, very active and all that stuff. I don't know what your vision was like when you were 17 years old before that car, car accident, but maybe it could have been sports or wanting to go somewhere that way. Sure. And then that happened, and... It's just crazy how it pivots you into now where you're at and everything. It's great that you use that word because it's the same word I use. I call them God's pivots. Yeah, uh, God's because, pivots. Because mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> what happened because of the breaking of the back? Well, I became a writer. Uh, and I learned uh, healing modalities to restore myself. So... <clears throat> um, and, and the journalism and the advertising took me into... Uh, narrative storytelling in uh, in depth, so and culture study, and so by the time I got to acting, what did I have? I had the mind of a writer. I knew how to put myself back together pretty quickly in all these action films when you're fighting Jean Claude Van Damme or Steven Seagal or Arnold Schwarzenegger, whoever it was, Chow Yun Fat, and. Um, and that was a great, it was the perfect combination. I consider the breaking the back a blessing, an actual blessing, because uh, it gave me the tools that I needed 10 years later to really accelerate. And the writing has stood with me ever since, you know. <laughs> since COVID, I've made a lot more money as a screenwriter and producer than I have from acting, because acting shut down for a And now we're in a strike. So, but today I have a writing session for a client that 
for doing stuff. So, uh, yeah, I, you know, I've done some work with wounded warriors, and we try and I try to convey to them it's a hard one because let's suppose you've been blown up by an IED and you've lost three limbs and you're burned over 85% of your body. How do you convince a guy or how do you have him experience mm -hmm. that that is actually one of God's pivots and they're directing you towards where you're going to go yeah, to fulfill your ultimate purpose? Uh, a lot of them get it. And some of them, it's a real hard journey. But, and, but I, I, in a sense, I don't believe in negative events because I think they're right. just part of what the deal is uh, to get you where you're, you're going. That's why I wanted to really bring that point up because I think there's a lot of people that are, are watching this there that they have things that happen in their life, but they look at it so bad and like it, like that's the thing that hold them back. Like, and they, they really resonate with it and like, man, this is why I can't be this anymore. This is why I can't be successful. This is why I can't do this. And I think a lot of people need to sit back and, and just be aware of and understanding again, not pissed off of why this happened to me, but right. why is this happening for me and understanding that this is, it's pivoting you and taking you somewhere. Like you said, God's pivot. I, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a hard one sometimes. I mean, I, I went through a difficult divorce and, literally felt like I was completely raped financially. But you have to come to the conclusion and uh, validate that mentally in yourself that it was appropriate because right. you're driven into other arenas economically and other skill sets in order to uh, compensate for that. So good comes from that quote unquote negativity uh, of that set of circumstances. In that case, the most important thing is if they're children that they uh, thrive. But um, to put aside bitterness and to put aside victimhood and all of that and move forward is really a critical thing for life uh, rather than going forward with that thing swirling around in you that's the very thing that's going to hold you back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, going out and getting started uh, around 30 and stuff and getting into the acting phase, mm -hmm. living with your buddy, because you guys were living together and he went on to go produce these um, acts. Yeah. Was he, do you think he was the official catalyst that like got you your career or was there somebody else? There's no else? question. He was a mentor and by, at least by observation mm -hmm. and also by literal, like I could always go to him and say, uh, should I be studying here or here or should I do that? And he would give, some of it was, had his bias. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, a central thing I find for people who want a career in entertainment is they really don't know where excellence lies. They're wandering right. in the wilderness, if you will, uh, to try to find excellence. And he was able to point out some places like that. And because I started working initially as his assistant and then as an assistant director on his Broadway shows and things like that. And that was absolutely key to my knowing where excellence lay. Right, um, right. So, uh, yeah, it's important to have. I try when I'm talking to people and teaching people to be that same type of yeah. uh, influence, to be somebody. Look, there's several ways you can do things. You can either wander in the wilderness and waste decades, or you can do it, for lack of a better term, an A-list way that gets you to the goal as fast as you possibly can. I agree yeah. with you, and that's why we do what we do with this podcast, man. We're trying to help people like not have to waste decades of their time and, and be able to shorten that, that learning curve or shorten their process of getting where they want to be. What do you think your main big challenge has been over yeah. the last years and, and, and doing what you're doing? I mean, from doing all three, like you're not just an actor, but just everything you're doing, if you were to look back in like the last 20 or 30 years, like what has been your main biggest challenge in your line of business of what you do? I, there's two of them, one of which we've already talked about is to try to remove negativity from your consciousness because it can permeate your reality. The other thing is... <clears throat> The creative aspects of filmmaking, <clears throat> the production aspects of filmmaking, 
are not challenging. They're challenging, but we can handle that, myself and my team. What is the most challenging of all is the financing of movies. Yeah. Mm. You know, it comes down to the, uh, the money uh, it becomes... The, the major hurdle for almost, it's the same for everybody. It doesn't matter if it's Spielberg or Akira Kurosawa. You know, he spent half of his life wandering the globe, Akira Kurosawa, uh, great master, begging for money to make his movies. And so you have to, the financing of things is probably the, the, the ultimate challenge to all of it. There's not a creative person here in Hollywood or anywhere who's probably not going to go to their grave with several unrealized projects because the funding just is not there for yeah. a particular reason. Um, now, you said some, um, being able to get that negative out, living, sure. living somewhere here where there's a lot of distractions, a lot of chaos going on and uh -huh. stuff like that. What do you do for yourself to just keep yourself focused and out of the nonsense that's going out in the world? Well, one of the savings grace, graces that I've always had was athleticism. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I'm on any given day, I'm usually doing something physical, which dispels a lot of negativity and uh, fills you with endorphins and oxygen and those kind of things. Uh, and as you get older, uh, increasing flexibility and movement is really vital because... Uh, I don't have a lot of bad habits, never really did uh, as far as, say, drinking or anything like that. Um, so keeping a positive, uh, pure food and diet as much as possible without being a fanatic is probably an, uh, some athleticism to balance off what could be the negativity or the sedentary uh, aspects of being a writer and a producer is... Uh, a key to that, um, uh, you know, I, if you're going to, uh, it might have been a very, very different circumstance for me if I became a, a zillionaire at 20, right? you know, like some of these athletes ha have, you know, yeah. they go from abject poverty to hundreds having of hundreds of, of millions of dollars yeah, at their disposal. And so that has never been my case. I had a family and I was always a working person. I had a very strong work ethic, mm -hmm. which I think I got from my parents as well. So, um, you know, I, I just like to be able to take care of the people that I need to take care of and keep going uh, professionally and creatively. And to be able to, I, I think a man or a woman needs to have the equipment they need. So you drive a nice car that inspires you and and um, uh, have some nice clothes. <laughs> yeah. And go from there. Uh, Look good, feel good, play good. It's how I always it. Yeah, I'll, I'll... and really, the only legacy we have really is our relationship with our kids, our love partner, whoever that is, and our work and our relationship with whatever spiritual entity you align yourself with. Uh, and so, increasingly, for me, it's like, act. let's take acting. If you're not into the creation of little moments yeah. as an actor, forget about fame or uh, the, the monetary aspects. They're all important factors. But if you're not really into the creation of, of, of moments, then you're probably not going to stay with <clears throat> acting. Yeah. If you're not really into the singing of of language and, and narrative structure and plot, then you're probably not gonna be a screenwriter. Um, you know, uh, so I think it's the legacy of craft that becomes the only thing that we carry into the hereafter uh, with us. So, you know, my nice car ain't gonna go into the afterlife with me. Right. It's nice to have that, uh, and you wanna feel like you're validated by the universe, but really what it comes down to is the work. Yeah, and that's what I've noticed with your screenwriting um, since I've known you is you actually dive deeper into studying the history of different cultures, different backgrounds, sure. different things that's going on. When you're screenwriting, 
how do you get so much inspiration and where do you get your inspiration of like, I'm gonna attack this culture for this screenwriting or I'm gonna attack this uh, uh -huh. plot for this screenwriting. Where do you get all that inspiration from to keep going on and on and on? Well, I, ha I was sort of a history minor, so I've always had a bent to being interested. And I think as a journalist, I was into collecting uh, the truth or the historical research of mm -hmm. it. I mean, I've been preparing to write something on boxing and fortunately, we live in a time where, I mean, YouTube, you can see every fight ever done. Yeah. You can read, I have a, a stack of books this high. Uh, so I, we've got a project that has to do with Native Americans fighting the Spaniards in the yeah. 1500s. So you read whatever you can about those particular cultures and circumstances before, it's, before you even sit down to write. And fortunately, we live in a time where you can just, I'm going along and, going, and I want to know how many people Coronado carried into the southwestern part of Arizona and stuff went on his particular raid for the seven cities of gold. I could just go to Google and find out at least what they have on it. Right. Yeah. So you used to have to get, <laughs> this is so perhaps before books, your time, yeah. but you had the Encyclopedia Britannica. I discovered that Santa Claus didn't exist when I discovered the Encyclopedia Britannica yeah. in my mother's closet because I knew that's what we were getting for Christmas. But you used to have these giant books that you had to do something. Yeah, uh, yeah that internet expedited all the research. I mean, you can do it so fast <laughs> and so uh, rapidly. You can create stuff really, really readily. I like doing the research. Look, I do think we're not making documentaries. But you have to, in the, they are going to be received by audiences today and tomorrow as accurate history. Right. So you have to put that set of circumstances to the point that you can to a circumstance that has to do with a historical situation because that's the way it's going to be passed along. Mm -hmm. uh, you take Oliver Stone and JFK. The... The circumstances there becomes the reality for future generations. So you have to kind of really make sure you're a as accurate as possible. Yeah. What do you think one of your biggest lessons over the last 40 years in the film industry in general has been for you? A life lesson or a business, business. lesson, yeah. you know? Marry a good woman who's inspiring and is really respects and is involved in everything that you're doing or yeah. a mate whatever if you're you know I in my case my wife is intimately involved in everything that happens at the film company and she has great uh, insight I would say listen to your spouse and partner uh, before you make a, a decision about things because uh, look Here's the other thing. Create a brain trust of people that you can rely on. They, they're not going to always be right, but I'm only able to do what I do, particularly in the movie space, unless I have a lot of really good people working for me and with me. Yep. They're not even working for me. They're working with me. And they're driven by that craft and aspirational desire to do something excellent as well. Yep. Nobody does it on their own. Yeah. So. I was going to ask you, so um, obviously I've never been in this space at all, so I, I might be asking it wrong, but when, when, you're, when you have a, a, a movie or a film that you want to make, yeah. when, whenever you find out that is, and then you have the actors that you want, how hard is it recruiting and getting those people to like, hey, man, I got this movie. You sit down with them, you sell them on the movie, and I want you to be this actor. Like, how hard is that, and what does that look like in the process of it? It's extremely challenging if you don't have a personal relationship with that person. Uh, uh, um, so let's I feel see. like that would be a big challenge in that space and everything. Yeah, Again, if you don't have a relationship, it's like hard to... Call him like, man, that, you know, he's going to be the one that's like going to be the lead actor. You have no clue. You don't know him. You don't really know that anybody knows him. And you're just reaching out to him like. Yeah, it's very hard because you're dealing then. If you don't have a personal relationship, then you're dealing with uh, agents. agents. Yeah, and agents, agents mm -hmm. even if they're gracious and supportive, uh, are motivated by different things than you might be. 
Um, and they also, in, in def their defense, they have a lot of things. Let's, if, let's suppose I wanted Javier Bardem to be in a movie, and he was perfect for it. In fact, we have a circumstance for the uh, project right now. We're trying to get somebody like that or, or Antonio Banderas to play the part uh, for three days. Um, it's so much money that it becomes prohibitive to, to even do it. Um, so if you don't have a personal relationship with it, with them, it's really, really hard. And that's where it ties back into the financial side because basically, I mean, I can imagine, it's like you got this movie, but you have all these moving parts, but I'm just throwing examples in my head. Like, man, if I needed these five actors, I'm gonna go pitch them all, but this one wants 100 grand, this one wants 250,000, this one wants this, this, Shoot, this. This one wants seven million, this one wants eight million. <laughs> no, I know, I'm just yeah. throwing numbers out there, but like, it, that's really how it is. And then obviously now you're, you're, you're trying to fund and get your, the movie production there. So it also like without finances, that's why that's probably the hardest thing in movie production or, or making one that you don't it's, have the right finances. It's even hard to get the right people in the right seats too. This is why you need to know but again, to refer back to our conversation about negative events, know the landscape monetarily, but don't be negatively held back by that. Right, it's yeah. worth a try. You know, um, so here's the reality about what you're talking about. There's distribution is driven in monetary things, finances, at a, at a certain game level is driven, driven by a very, very short list of actors. And every independent film is trying to place them in their project because it elevates the value of the rights so much. Mm -hmm. They don't have a lot of time because they're doing studio movies and stuff like that. And every independent film is trying to get those same people. And it's a very small list. I, so I, it's I a, so. A, a really... So, my response to that is really is often to try to do two things. Structure the project so that you don't need those people in order to financially ex execute the project. Mm. Um, it's worth a try, but everybody's fighting against that right now. Yeah. And that's really what the deal is. It's a common refrain among filmmakers of all kinds. Yeah. Um, so, and one thing I've learned, um, from the process of it is, and it makes sense whenever you say it is if you have a movie and you want to get Scarlett Johansson on the movie, well, you go to her and she says, all right, well, I want X amount. Well, then they're not going to sign anything until you can prove that you got that X amount for them. So right. now you got to go over here and get the financing. You're just going to say, Hey, I got Scarlett <clears throat> Johansson, but she wants X amount, but she's not going to sign but they're not going to give you the financing until she signs. So like they both are picky because they yeah. want to say, they want to see that you got it first rather than a verbal commitment. Yeah, and stuff. I call so, that the inch. The inch. Okay. Yeah. Cause, yep. and, the, and I'll explain <laughs> it or touch upon it because I have empathy for them and it's important. So you have an agent, even Scar, I have dealt with Scarlett Johansson to some extent on a project and um, at least her agents. Mm -hmm. You got a brilliantly crafted project. <clears throat> the, as you say, the financing guys want to know that the name actor is on board, attached. And so, it, let's say Scarlett Johansson, her reps are interested in the project. And the financer is interested in financing the project. But they're an inch away from each other, <laughs> and neither one of them wants to pick up the phone first, because if the financier picks up the phone first, then the agent is going to assume, oh, they really want Joe, Scarlett Johansson, so I'm going to jack the price up three times. But if the agent picks up the phone first, he's going to assume that the financiers, oh, they think they're going to be able to lowball us because I picked up the phone first. Yeah. So no, the producer's okay. job becomes, how do I get these people to meet at that inch? across that inch without one or the other being ego-driven ego to think that they're going to be taken advantage of. Yeah. So, um... You got to be like, like you got to, you, you, 
you gotta have really good communication and like bridging that gap. It goes to back make to it. relationships, you well, know, just a, yeah. having building and building that long term relationship to make it doable. It makes it easier. Yeah, you got the relationship. A, a, a little bit of a, a what I would say and what I tell young filmmakers is tell the financier here's a list of ten people, the person finance the movie and that person will be drawn from that list. Yep, because uh, it, so. Maybe you can bring the inch a little closer that way. Hmm. You know, mm-hmm. here's a list. They're all great. It'll be one of those people. What advice would you give to anyone that is starting to just get in this space and just starting to want to be a filmmaker? Actually, you know what? I got to. I got to. Let me producer. let me direct the question a little bit better. Anyone? Let's. We'll do two of them. I want to do a filmmaker and an actor. What advice would you give to anybody that's like, man, I want to be an actor and then I'm just starting to get in? Like, what would you give them right now? Well, the long answer is that everybody's set of circumstances is different. The answer is different if you're 32 and you live in South Dakota than it is if you're 18 and you live in L.A. or San Francisco or New York. So if I was counseling that person, I would tell them uh, different things. So... uh, more tailored to the person then so it's kind of like a more of a hard question yeah it's like almost a medical diagnosis how do we get you healthy uh and goal to your goal if you're if if you're uh if you're a young person i would let's say you're 11 and you want to be an actor okay well i would say first go to a, a performing high school so that you can do as many plays as you possibly can there and then think about going to Juilliard in New York or Carnegie Mellon or USC or UCLA or, or uh, American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco uh, or AFI it's where you can get a great classical acting, filmmaking, and make relationships with people who are going to be the dominant force in your generation. Uh, if somebody's 35 and they want to be an actor, that's not really a possibility. Then I would say, where are you living? Uh, um, if, you, if, if, if that was the case, I'd say, take a look at Groundlings over here, because uh, they've had five or seven a year Academy Award nominees that come out of the comedy school. Or take a look at the Beverly Hills Playhouse or study with Patrick Kilpatrick when I was doing that. I'm not doing that right now because the producing and directing and screenwriting is so involving. But how do you get an A-list education as rapidly as you can? And if you do it right, you can do it within a year or uh, yeah. you won't even recognize your 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 life. and. Put an emphasis on auditioning, uh, and, and but every aspect of it. So it's a different answer for whatever a particular person's set of circumstances is. What about for a filmmaker? Well, the little, same thing is true. Yeah. I mean, look, if you can go to some place like USC or UCLA or New York University, uh, that's great. At the same time, Spielberg... He did go to USC, I think, years later, but he was making films when he was nine years old. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, Bill Clinton became president because he started thinking about becoming president when he was a kid. So uh, go ahead and start making films. You can get a camera and you can start. And here's the other thing that a lot of people miss. You can always spend nothing for free, commune with the masters. How did other great filmmakers do stuff? How did Stanley Kubrick do his movies? How did Spielberg do his movies? Just watch the bloody movies and and emulate that. Figure out, like when I began as a writer, I read Fitzgerald or Hemingway or Faulkner or uh, people like that and mimic the style. Uh, Hunter Thompson, how do you write like Hunter Thompson? And then find your own voice that way. So, you know, yeah. you, can, you can commune with the masters and it doesn't cost you a dime. Hmm. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. You want to like tell those people to... <laughs> no, we're good. We're good. We're, we're good. No worries. Ask little, little loud we, guys. Uh, we're good. 
Cool. Um, well, sweet. We, we could wrap it up with a couple more conversational questions and stuff like that. Um, let's talk about like, now let's, let's just pivot to like, what, what, what are you doing now? Yeah. What's your, what, yeah. what's your goals? Like what, what, what is now this like afternoon? We're tweaking a project called flight 2222, which I was hired to do the adaptation of a book by a, uh, uh, a, a man named Thomas Nevius, sir. Uh, I wrote the script, uh, we got a great director who directed me in um, Death Warrant with Jean-Claude Van Damme, yeah. really fine director. He also was the executive producer of uh, House and did a lot of the writing for the television series House. So he's coming on board to direct. He gave us notes on the script, we're implementing uh the notes, then it goes back to him, and then that package of him attached as the director. We've done all the casting lists. Uh, I'll probably meet with Darren and figure out which of these people on these lists you want in the movie, sign them up, and then uh, go to the financing entities and say, here's the package, and um, yeah. we'd like you to fund it. It's been budgeted. Um, I've got a second volume of my memoir, which is all, all show business all the time. So uh, I'm hoping that'll be of wide interest. Um, we have a slate of really dynamic projects, one which is with financing entities. Uh, and they're going to let us know whether they're going to make a television series out of it for 10 episodes. That would be fantastic. Very topical, very contemporary. Has to do with our relationship with China and Taiwan. Um, so it's getting all those projects, finding the partners, the financial people for those, those particular projects. And how many projects are you currently working on right now? Did I hear two or three? We have about six. <laughs> six. So you got six total. Nice. One yeah. of them, or a couple of them I know can turn into like 10 year series, huh? Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, you, I, certain topics you try to write expansively, even though they may originally be written in a manner that's one large film, it's easy to adapt it to a, either a mini series or a couple of years worth of content or yeah. stuff like that. So um, there's that, and then there's play with the grandkids. There you that's go. It. How many you grandkids know, spend you have? as much time with my wife as I possibly can. How many grandkids you have? You know, it's a wonderful. I have a grandson who's my son's boy he's nine months but my wife has two sons and they each have two daughters and the four-year-old Kira went to her father and said your father is dead he's not alive he's not here and she went to her mother a couple days later and said your father is dead he's not here he's not alive and a couple days after she said I don't have a grandfather, so can Patrick be my grandfather? And so uh, they said, well, why don't you ask him? So she asked me, so I picked up two granddaughters, uh, which was a great honor, and uh, awesome. I have a lot. So essentially I have three right now. That's so. I'm just going to show you real quick. That's my beautiful family right there. My, uh, she'll be nine months on the fifth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, your Bless child is about to say, oh, it went away, but they looked all beautiful. Here, I'll just, uh, right there, she's oh, a yeah. screensaver. There you go. She's, uh, she's, she'll be nine months on the 5th, and then we have another one on the way. Well, but, fan uh, fantastic. They're yeah, beautiful. Your November wife's very yeah, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Fiance, You're so. a handsome guy, so you should be. Coming up with... Uh, so are you. When you put those glasses on, man. Yeah, <laughs> well, and they're all like that. Purple. I like them. I'm kind of the Elton John of this building. <laughs> uh, when it comes to glasses, if you, I, you know, I may get some LASIK sooner or later, and then they they say you don't need glasses at least for a period of time from that. But I've got a lot of them. Yeah, I mean, You're at the end of the them, day, it's well. style. You know what? You put style on them, so at the end of the day, you could keep them. You know, there's a wonderful place called High Optics uh, up uh, on uh, Hollywood Boulevard, and they do a great job of coming up with all kinds of periods, sunglasses and things like that. And sometimes you use them in movies and sometimes, you know, uh, Emmanuel up there is a really great, great guy. Yep, yep. 
And I guess lastly, man, how's your experience been out here in South California for such a long time? I don't know how old you are, but I think I've been here longer than you've been alive. But uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 27 I, years? I believe it. New York was a great place. New York City, after university, was a fantastic place. I went there and I was a bodyguard for rock groups. And I began writing and I began acting there. And it was a great place to do that. Yeah. Uh, it, it was a fantastic place. But like I said, I realized I was up for a change after about 10 years, and I realized there was far more television work out here at the time. And about 50% of my income was coming from television uh, series and guest starring on shows. So I was ready for a movie, uh, for a move out here. Then LA was infinitely easier to live in than New York, and I still think it for is. Sure. It still it is. Uh, and it was renter's paradise out here yeah. then. Um, so uh, I've been here since 87. Uh, yeah. I think, you know, L.A., despite its challenges, is still a pretty great place to live. I'd like to see, which is one reason why I ran for governor in the recall thing, I'd like to see some changes. I was really hoping Rick Caruso would become what, mayor. What type of changes would you like to see? Well, let's take a, a, a big issue like homelessness, right. okay? Yeah. I think you have a homeless industry operating now, and people are making a lot of money on the situation, governmental agencies and things. I think, you know, like we were talking about no negative events. I think you have to come from the circumstances that homelessness is unacceptable in a civilized society in its current uh, form. Yeah. And and my theory of it, and you can go to uh, killpatrickforgovernor.com because we left the platform up, is what does the National Guard do? The National Guard, uh, um, um, among other things, can build a city in about three days, okay? They just know how to do that. Mm -hmm. So I would find state land, uh, local land someplace, and have the National Guard um, build a city, all right? So at that point, professionals process people who are homeless. Now, homelessness is made up by people who are, uh, have drug issues, have mental issues, have the desire to just live off a dole and not do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so there's a combination of their veterans, a big veteran component. Yeah. So you process those people. And uh, those who have substance uh, uh, abuse issues should be treated. And if they don't, then you're going to go to jail. And that's the tough love part of it. And by the way, there's no recovery program that doesn't have an aspect of tough love to it. If you're able-bodied and you're able to work, then the state ought to have a, like uh, they had in the 30s, a work uh, projects administration that paints bridges, that does forestry stuff, that uh, beautifies uh, things so that people can get a job right. and be given a place to live through that project. If you're a veteran, and, uh, there's an overlap of, of these things. If you are, have schizophrenia, then you need to be treated. And, and, and so, but you have to come from the circumstance that homelessness is unacceptable in a civilized society. Right, I agree. And I don't think government officials come from that. Yeah. They come from, oh, look, they're, right now they're touting this big thing. They took 42 people at a great cost and put them over there. That's not a solution to homelessness. No. So uh, we have a lot of challenges. I think the answers are there. Let's take, we're in a drought. The people don't know there are three desalination plants that are not working in the state. They don't function. Why? Yeah. They don't have enough water to give to farmers to grow food, but... They're not fixing the... They're problem. not fixing the desalination plants. Yeah. It's... it's I'm not going to mince words. California is run by a corrupt uh, oligarchy that keeps itself in power, 
by massive taxation and by huge contributions that keep certain groups in power. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to change until it changes. And the way it has to change is by voting. And people seem to not care enough to actually alter the landscape politically. Um, that's my position, and I'm going to yeah. stay there, and, yeah. I, and I see it. Still in all, California is a fabulous place to live. But starting a small business here, <coughs> the state is not a, a supportive of, of, the, of, of that process. And that's where we get to see it in Arizona. Everyone starting their businesses, bringing them from California, yeah. bringing them from all over the place to start them now in Arizona because it's the closest thing to California and the, you know, Better way to grow. Cheaper and easier. Well, cheaper and, I, cheaper I and think easier, yeah. government should be yeah. uh, a, a facilitator of small and large businesses as long as those businesses are functioning responsibly and not polluting and not doing uh, complete ravagement of their workers and things like that. It's about common sense, and there's not a lot of common sense. No, there's not. Or yeah. vision being yeah. applied to a lot of things. So... Um, <clears throat> Uh, we'll see. Yeah. We, we really will see. Yep, we'll see. Um, sweet. Well, we'll end it there. Um, if you guys are listening to this podcast, watching this podcast, I hope you guys got a ton of value from it. I know I did just being able to have a conversation and learn a lot of different things. Um, being able to take notes and just apply stuff that you got to your life, <laughs> to your journey. And someone that needs to hear this, whether it be a family member, a friend, coworker, whatever, just share it with them. It's FGMB podcast everywhere. And again, I want to shout out that website again. You said Kilpatrick, vote Kilpatrick or Kilpatrick for governor. Well, I'm not currently running. This I know, but I want call, people to look into this. If you want to look at the platform, what's, I, I shocking, what's shocking is <laughs> nobody else came up with a platform. So you can go to KilpatrickForGovernor.com. Okay. But I want to say I've got a movie coming out called Nessie. This is shameless uh, moments of self-promotion. Do it. Do called it, yeah. About the Loch Ness Monster. It's family entertainment. I think it's, it's fun. Uh, directed by Robbie Moffat. That's coming out. I'm in mid-production for a film called Dying for Living. Yes. And I hope you, you'll uh, enjoy that when it comes out. Uh, so onward and upward. And... Uh, if somebody needs to get a hold of me, it's not very hard through social media and things yeah, like that. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for giving us your time today, man. Thank Appreciate you for it. having me. Nice to meet me. you. It was Thank awesome. You. Yep. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah.